Professor Ding, Professor Mesra, members of the organizing committee, Fudan University, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply humbled by the honor that has been given to me and the opportunity to speak in the People's Republic of China in Shanghai. Uh, it's particularly important for me to show basically what is the product of many years of hard working to try to get something done. The problem of end-state general disease is ballooning. The world, in the words of Professor Eli Friedman, cannot afford end-state general disease in its present form. It is estimated that between 400 and 500,000 patients in the United States have end-stage renal disease and about two or perhaps more than two because not all the data are in, two million people are currently in the globe with ESRD getting some time of renal replacement therapy or dialysis. China from the sources I've learned, including discussions with my honored colleague, Professor Lee, uh, seems to expect another million people on dialysis in a few years. India, now that they implementing coverage for dialysis and people are eating better, the incidence of end-stage general disease is growing as well. So just between China, China and India, we might have double the population of dialysis in the globe. And this does not include the growing needs in South America, Europe, Africa. It's just right, just around the globe. The problem is that no matter how much money we spend, how much resources we spend, how much we try to keep patients on dialysis alive, end-stage general disease on dialysis may have a mortality between 12 and 20 percent per year. That is simply not acceptable. It's not acceptable that we have so many people dying and we basically keep doing not very different today the same treatments we've been doing for decades. The mortality on dialysis is similar to that of carcinoma of the breast or metastatic carcinoma of the colon. Yet, there is more awareness of the deadliness or mortality, should we say, of metastatic disease than of end-stage renal disease. This slide is one of many, there are probably more than a thousand papers by now, extolling the virtues of daily dialysis. And this is one of the earlier slides done by Professor Kielström. Uh, there were other pioneers that pioneered daily dialysis, uh, like Dr. Lockridge from Virginia and others. And they show that if you dialyze three times a week, you have more chances to be dead than if you dialyze in center every day, but even more chances to be alive if you dialyze at home. So there is no secret of why patients on dialysis at home do better if they do the same time on dialysis. It's because patients that are on dialysis at home are usually those that are more compliant more uh, reliable in observing the diet, the infection control, and many other rules that we have to impose on these patients to stay alive. But the bottom line remains, if you dialyze longer, you're going to live longer on dialysis. So we know that there is a myriad of comorbidities on dialysis, and a myriad or many factors that create problems and basically generate the plight and the suffering of this unfortunate population. 
We create blunt and massive changes in fluid balance by removing liters of fluid every other day, unphysiological. We suddenly change electrolyte concentration and pH, which generates arrhythmias and other problems. We do not clear enough middle molecules, which are a body marker of many toxins. We barely remove all the phosphorus we need to remove, so we have to resort to phosphate binders. If you dialyze daily, you typically do not need phosphate binders because we remove enough phosphorus, but that is a minority of the patients. We do not remove well protein-bound toxins. The problem is those toxins in which the uh, fraction that is toxic is free is removed nicely by dialysis. But as soon as you stop dialysis, there is a rebound in the free fraction that was reduced from the bound to protein fraction until they equilibrate and you once more have a toxic level of some toxins. Peak wrestle is the perfect example. We don't control water hypertension. We have an excess of salt. If we tend to use low dialysate uh, sodium, you have a better control of dialysis, but that's difficult. We have learned that we have endothelial dysfunction due to multiple causes. Left ventricular hypertrophy has become a surrogate for cardiac mortality, and it's been shown in the FHN trial. The patients are hemodynamically stable because of many reasons, so they have high blood pressure, low blood pressure at the end of dialysis, and those ups and downs certainly don't contribute to their health. Arrhythmias, strokes, anemia, sleep apnea, hyperparathyroidism, the burden of all the pills they have to take. Some patients tell me, doctor, if I take all my pills and add some dressing, I will have a salad. There is wonderful work that is an eye-opener done by Dr. McIntyre in the United Kingdom showing myocardial stunning after dialysis or during dialysis. Amazing and definitely eye-opening in terms of cardiovascular mortality. We all know they have increased coronary disease, neurological, dia neurological deficits, they have misery, misery, enormous fatigue and inability to function on the day of dialysis. We impose draconian diets and draconian limitations on fluid and salt intake. They sleep poorly or don't, they're depressed, who wouldn't be? They spend long hours tethered, tied to a machine. They have multiple sources of pain and these folks are uh, mostly disabled. They cannot contribute to society and they have an economic burden to themselves because they're not productive. They cannot generate money so the burden falls on their dear family and society or the state. So with daily dialysis we have found out that it's a very promising thing. And here's just a list of the things that we've seen improved with dialysis. And I will not have enough time uh, to go into details of all the problems that we have solved with daily dialysis. Uh, the quality of life that remains after spending hours on the machine is great, but there is a price to be paid because if you stick the same fistula, not three times a week, but six or seven times a week, you will definitely need more vascular interventions. Those fistulas will not last too long. But there are other obstacles to implement in daily dialysis. There's nowhere to do it. We can't keep building more dialysis units. The home market, the home space is limited to those that can afford it, have the space, have the water, have the know-how. There's nobody to do it in the unit. In China, there might be a great amount of nurses that can be generated very quickly, and I salute that. But in most places in Europe and the United States, nurses don't grow on trees, they're expensive, and it's very difficult to train them. So there's nobody to take care of the patients on dialysis in the dialysis units, and if they don't go home, there's nowhere to do more. 
And last but not least, what does His Majesty the patient think? He hates to be on the machine hours on end. He wants his freedom to move around instead of being tied like a prisoner to a machine. So we decided to look into this and say, well, the humankind has been able to miniaturize anything and everything. What a better place to look at than the popular Republic of China, where the technology, the amazing technology, has shown how you can miniaturize things. So today you know very well how to do with the smartphone what you needed a mainframe years ago. And it also makes sense that you can tell with a, uh, with a wristwatch the time as well as you could with a grandfather clock. So we decided that if everything is miniaturized, why couldn't we miniaturize a dialysis machine? So we embarked on reducing a machine that can be 150 to 100 kilos and requires 110 or 220 volts and requires 120 liters of fresh pure water into something that you could wear on your belt it works it would work on batteries and require very little water so what you see here on the right side of this slide is the first prototype that was used in humans in the United Kingdom with uh, the collaboration with Professor Davenport in London. This was published in Lance and this is the device we used. I will get into more details. It weights about 10 pounds. Uh, the main system is powered with one 9 volt battery. It requires other batteries for the other what we call micro pumps, usually are AA batteries and it uses a hollow fiber polysulfon dialyzer and it requires only 375 ml of sterile water. Why can we afford sterile water? Because we don't need 120 liters. We need only less than half a liter of half normal saline and that's what we use to prime the system. So here is the scheme of the blood circuit in the world of artificial kidney. In blue is a schematic of a belt. In red you have the blood circuit coming from the patient. And it's in red like we call it the arterial source even if it is a double lumen catheter. And what you see in the white rectangle is a reservoir of heparin. Next to it there is a little cylinder there and that symbolizes the micro pump that pumps heparin into the circuit. Then that red uh, colored tube goes through a double channel pump and from that is pumped into the dialyzer and once the blood exits the dialyzer now in blue it's returned to the patient. This device has a bubble detector and uh, as a safety mechanism so we know that this will not have bubbles although there is no air in this device. Here is a little bit more complicated the dialysis circuit. Let's start with those three yellow circles on your right hand side. Those are the purifying sorbents containers that cleans the dialysate. Then the green line moves into the dialyzer and on the way it is receiving now depicted in black a electrolyte uh, solution to normalize calcium, magnesium and sometimes potassium and it's pumped by another little cylinder which is a micro pump and it enters the green circuit as early uh, as late as possible just before it enters the dialyzer. Now the dialyze, the dialysate goes into counter current uh, flow as opposed to the blood in the dialyzer like everyone else does and once it emerges from the, dia from the dialyzer 
is now depicted in yellow. The reason we depict it in yellow, of course, is because it symbolizes all the detritus and toxins that should come in the urine but don't on dialysis patients. So basically we like to call this sometimes artificial urine. And now you have a little pump, a little yellow cylinder that takes a part of the dirty spent dialysate and delivers it into a bag, a plastic bag, the yellow rectangle at the bottom. And this yellow rectangle is a plastic bag very similar to the bag that patients with a bladder catheter have where the urine collects except here it collects the ultrafiltrate or the artificial urine if you will and then it can be emptied into the toilet safely. The rest of the dialysate is circulated through those three circles which symbolize the containers with so of sorbents that regenerate the dialysate and then in brown you have another brown rectangle containing bicarbonate pumped into the circuit by the little cylinder who is nothing but a little pump that pushes the bicarbonate in to keep the patient free from acidosis and improve the pH inside the circuit. Now in next slide we see the unique flow data in the main pump. The main pump that propels blood and dialysate is only one pump with two channels and the flow in those two channels is in opposite phase and pulsating. So it's not laminar flow, it's pulsating flow. And when you see pulsating flow in red you see each peak and trough of the blood compartment and in gray, each peak and trough of flow of the dialysate compartment. What that means is that when the blood compartment is at the peak flow, the, the dialysate compartment is at the trough, and vice versa. Intermittently, there is a push-pull mechanism in both directions that changes the transmembrane pressure 60 or 70 times per minute and this has several virtues. Here you have more in detail the blood flow in red. On the left hand side the wearable artificial kidney pump and on the right hand side the flow pattern of a conventional roller, conventional roller pump and as you can see the amplitude of those two is completely different. There's no pulsation in the conventional pump and there's no intermittent changes in the transmembrane pressure as in the uh, wearable artificial kidney or WAC pump. Now what this does is many things but between others it removes flow fluid at the physiological rate. In other words we do know in the upper panel in yellow you have the, the interstitial space and as you remove fluid from the middle cylinder uh, at a rapid rate uh, what you will have is that a large amount of fluid goes into the dialyzer causing hypotension. But in the lower panel if you remove less fluid per hour because you do it 24 hours 7 days a week you can afford to remove only 50 to 100 ml per hour which is the same rate at which your normal kidneys remove fluid. The end result is that the rate of refilling of fluid from the interstitial space to the vascular space allows for maintaining the patient uvolemic at all times and there should be no hypotension. So how do you access this? Well, you have a, uh, a double lumen catheter and the double lumen catheter is just instead of the usual double lumen catheter that exits the body at the level of the chest, this catheter is a little longer and it's tunneled under the skin to exit above the belt. So most of the length of the catheter 
is subcutaneous and not likely to be entangled with anything. So you will say, well, Dr. Gura, why would you advocate a catheter when in your previous lecture you told us catheters are bad? Well, catheters are bad if you don't know how to use them, if you don't observe a septic technique, but if you do not expose the catheter to any infections and you open and close it only in a sterile environment, then doing what Semmelweis said you should do, use a sterile environment, wash your hands, sterile gloves, sterile masks, gowns, then there's no problem with the catheters. There are no bad catheters, they're bad users of catheters. So why after all a catheter? Because it's unsafe to have a patient hooked to a dialysis machine with two needles held by a piece of tape. If you let that patient walk into a bus or walk the streets and the needles come out, you would have a disaster. So you can't possibly afford to do anything but to use a catheter, which you can lock, you can secure, and you can avoid that the needles will come out because there are no needles. So moving right forward, here are data from the trial we were fortunate enough to do with uh, the team headed by uh, Professor Davenport in the United Kingdom. This was published in Lancet and we removed as much fluid as we wanted to. The patient, we removed a very significant amount of urea in only eight hours of treatment. So if you are a 70 kilograms adult eating a gram per kilo per day of protein and you produce 16 or 20 grams of urea per day, it stands to reason that we would keep the patient with a normal urea. We have still to prove it in more studies, but this is what we saw in our first trial. We typically like to see one milligram of creatinine per day, uh, one gram of creatinine per day removed. So if we removed around 800 milligrams in eight hours, it stands to reason that we removed enough creatinine to keep the patient in good shape and have a good clearance. We are not fans of KT over V for several reasons, but be it as it may, if you would measure the hourly KT over V, KT over v and extrapolate it to a weekly KT over V, that would be a KT over V of 5.04. Well, I will concur with anyone in the audience that will criticize the use of an hourly KT over V to extrapolate it to a week. And I will agree with that, but until we don't do a week of treatment, we won't find out, will we? We didn't see any signs of hemolysis, but we didn't treat the patients for too long, so we'll have to find out that. There were no problems with electrolytes or acid base. We removed quite a lot of phosphorus. So we published that uh, we remove enough phosphorus and enough beta-2 microglobulins so that if we would be able to keep removing phosphorus like this, patient would not need phosphate binders. And we removed enough beta-2 microglobulins to indicate that we remove equal or similar to what a normal adult makes in terms of beta-2 microglobulins. So, were the patients happy? Unanimously, yes. Uh, not all of them walked, but they were encouraged to walk. The first four patients we treated were for four hours, not because we wanted to do less, but because that's what the regulated, regulating authorities allowed. And the next four patients were allowed for eight hours, we would have liked to do more, but again, regulators always have the last say on what we can and cannot do, so we went for a total of eight hours. But all the patients unanimously would love to see this patient tried by themselves again and other patients. 
So, in summary, in that trial in London we showed that we might remove enough fluid to uh, have patients eating and drinking without restrictions and have fluid removal at a physiological rate. Um, we have flows that are much slower than conventional dialysis. You use a blood flow of 60-80 ml per hour and with that flow it's difficult to get hemodynamic changes. We did not see any intradialytic hypotension, that is no patient drop blood pressure during dialysis with a wearable artificial kidney, which is different from what we used to see time and again on patients on usual dialysis. And we would hope that we will not have adverse hemodynamic changes when we use this device for longer periods of time. We thought that the effective removal of beta-2 microglobulins might play a role in improving outcomes. And uh, we removed enough phosphorus and toxins to assume that the patients would or might do better. We still have to prove it, but this is the best I can give you today because there are no other data. This was the first human on the planet walking with a world of artificial kidney uh, on the uh, garden around or inside San Bartolo Hospital in Vicenza, Italy. This was the first trial we ever did. In this particular trial, the co configuration of the wearable artificial kidney was solely for ultrafiltration before we thought about using it for other things. We did this in collaboration with Professor Claudio Ronco. In London, we wondered if the patients could sleep or not with this device. So even though for ethical reasons we covered their eyes, take my word they were all asleep nicely with the device. So we found a way that people, yes, can sleep, can walk around, will be able to go to work, I hope so. Will they be able to have sex? I believe so. If there is a will, there is a way. This is a picture I had the honor of taking. This lovely lady dances while blood is flowing through the wearable artificial kidney. And I have, I'm a firm believer that one picture is worth a thousand words. So, is this good or bad for the patients? Well, this is a lengthy solution, a lengthy complicated slide, but we would hope that we would improve malnutrition as we don't limit salt, we don't limit any food. Fluid overload is simply non-existent because you can dial in whatever you want in terms of fluid removal. We would le have less inflammation, less red cell loss, better nutrition, we might reduce the need for transfusions, use of iron, and use of epogen or other uh, stimulators of bone marrow. We might improve hypertension as we remove more salt and volume. We will not have, hopefully, hypotensive episodes, less heart disease, less strokes. All these are expectations, hypothetical hopes that still need to be proven. But we would like to venture that we are on the right path. In conclusion, so far we've shown that the wearable artificial kidney is feasible on bench studies, animal studies, and human subjects. The current available data are only preliminary but indicate that the wearable artificial kidney might be safe and efficient. We hypothesize that we will reduce costs, improve quality of life, and decrease mortality. Rest assured, we plan to prove this in further studies, but this is as much as I can hypothesize from the data I have. So in the next few years, the world of dialysis has to change. Hopefully the treatment of kidney failure will be more affordable and patients will have a better and longer life. 
I am again grateful to Fudan University, Professor Ding, the People's Republic of China, for having this uh, servant of yours presenting here, and my colleagues will answer the questions. Thank you so much for putting up with me. I have no words for expressing my gratitude. Thank you so much.